too often the nights we lead are bifurcated into the formal and the informal. And so John Manison is actually the woman's son. He wears a suit during the day and promptly wears cloth at night. If you went to his house during the day, if you went, he went out, he would be eating rice and chicken. If he came home, he would promptly settle around his fufu. And we have these two identities that sometimes clash, sometimes meet at awkward times. So anybody who tries to make us make peace with our dual selves is doing us a favor. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the young man who is going to attend it today. Giving 
the Fema Moon Memorial Lecture, it's an honor I do not take lightly. I'm many years removed from my days studying economics as a college student, and with no doctorate or PhD to my name, no published academic writings, not even sitting in the class of dondology. I am presumably wholly unqualified to be engaged in this sort of academic exercise. Yet, I strongly believe there is value in fortifying the relationship between academia and the outside world. And I do believe it was reiterated just before I came. I'm further emboldened by Professor Kofi Anido, who led me onto a very rarely spoken truth. The truth that most of Dr. Amu's seminal compositions, such as Yena Assassini and Warwick and Tate, were created in his 20s and 30s. There's clearly power in the youthful mind. So I'll begin with the first verse an inter interrogation of popular music, self actualization, and the Amu approach. How do we reimagine who we are? In this keynote, I address the importance of popular music and how we see and express ourselves. Additionally, I speak to self-actualization as an important factor in this conversation. How does African popular music, and by extension, popular music culture, play a role in our ability to achieve our potential as individuals and in turn as a collective? I analyze how factors such as technology allow for new heights of immediacy and resonance for popular music. There is a bridge between the influence of popular music and the theory in psychology known as self-actualization. Uh, I know, I know, I'm using both for I guess it, but I don't know what's here, but by the end it won't make sense. There's a bridge between the influence of popular music and the theory in psychology known as self-actualization. I support my analysis with anecdotes from the last few decades, as well as the connection between the Mahou and popular music. How did this radical pre-independence approach to composition, triggered by an interrogation of popular music, spark a cultural revolution with profound implications on the African identity and psyche? And what can we learn from this as Ghanaians of today? My focus on popular music, and not traditional music or arts music, is based on its overwhelming relevance to the youth, in particular to the millennials, the generation born between 1980 and 2000. If you're a millennial, say I. I am not alone. <laughs> Popular music is one of the most significant influences in shaping the thinking and behavior of young people. In Christina Williams' 2001 research piece titled Does It Really Matter? Young People and Popular Music, she says, quote, It is important that people's own accounts of their lives are taken seriously. She continues on to say, I feel like it's only respectful to ask people about their engagements with popular culture rather than simply making assumptions or developing theories without contacting the people being discussed. Hence why I'm here. <laughs> um, I would argue that the world is not divided into, two, into fans and non-fans, but rather that people engage with music in different ways at different times." End quote. On the matter of self-actualization, I use the hierarchy of needs framework proposed by the psychologist Abraham Maslow, a five-tier pyramid model of human needs. So from bottom to top, the five-tier model of the hierarchy of human needs consists of the first one is biological and physiological needs, the second one is safety needs, shelter, security, all that, all of that good stuff. The third one is love and belonging needs, if you've been in love. The fourth one is esteem needs, esteem for oneself and respect for others. And the fifth one, which is what is of concern to this keynote, is self-actualization. So self-actualization for all intents and purposes of this keynote is realizing your potential through creativity and a mental and spiritual awakening. The cultivation of popular music in an indigenized fashion by contemporary musicians on the continent and in the diaspora is shifting the gaze of aspiration from Af of African millennials from a Western prison to an African one. I seek to further the conversation on the importance of popular music in the self-actualization agenda, to center popular music with intention and outline the social cultural power that comes with the music. So that's the, as you see, one summary of what I'm going to talk about. So let me get to the meat of the matter. Verse 2. 
They are for self publication. Popular music influence on there. I'm not approach. I begin with the assessment critique directed at Amu during his time as a teacher and catechist in training at the Kukon Presbyterian College in the 1920s and early 1930s. Quote Teacher Amu, why are you now teaching vulgar songs like Yam outside the seminary? Unquote. End quote, sorry. In the eyes of his Christian colleagues, Adopting the wildly popular young on such dance team was sacrilegious. Even though Amun wrote entirely new and sanitized lyrics to the young for some melody, members of the church and some of his colleagues at the training college remained opposed and could not be placated. According to one of his bi biographers, Fred Ajiman, they were concerned Amun was contaminating the minds and souls of the students with his pagan songs. Very heavy. Yet Amun's interrogation of Yang Ponsa was one of the pivotal points in his approach towards compositions. In a 1993 conversation with Professor Kofia Gao, Dr. Amun tells a fascinating story about what I refer to as the Yang Ponsa provocation and this lasting influence on him. Quote, well you see, before I started writing in our idiom, you know there's a popular dance team in Ghana called Yang Ponsa. Now, there used to be a general producer at Chimata during those days. And one Mr. Ward, a historian but also a musician, wrote something in that journal about Goku's songs and quoted this as an example. And the principal of the training college at the Coupon read about this. Uh, Dr. Wu goes on to describe the curiosity of Reverend Ferguson, the principal. He says, What is this tune you are concerned? I want to hear the students sing it. So I asked the students to sing it. Of course it is a dance tune, we had all heard it, and we all knew it, and they sang it. He concludes by elaborating on the personal, on, on his, on the personal influence of young ones on him. Quote, when I went home that day, I said, but I ought to produce this in actual writing. I must write down the notation. Later when I learned drumming, I found that this technique of combining triple effect with double effect was there too. And that made me come upon what I now describe as a basic African rhythm. So that's how I got rhythm." End quote. It was a radical act for Dr. Amu to accept and adopt Yang Ponsa. Furthermore, it was a fascinating feat reconciling Yang Ponsa's adoption with the staunch Christian beliefs and the Eurocentric academic conception of music which prevailed at the time. This was the 1920s, after all, when African music elements were inherently considered pagan. Popular music then, and now share common one. It is not the preserve of those formerly trained in music or composition, unlike art music or classical music. One difference, however, is that in those earlier decades of the 20th century, popular music was made to belong to the public domain as part of folk folklore, Professor John Collins details how Yang Bonsa was associated with different creators. The first instance is in 1918 by a group of Ghanaian cocoa brokers who are working in the town of Apija, who are a kind in southern Ghana. Obviously, I had to go to the mountain to try and figure out where Apija is, so if you know you, yeah, that's great. And uh, we have 16 regions now, so it's a little bit more difficult. <laughs> um, the second instance was in 1924, as it was held in Kibi. And the third instance, Professor Collins uh, recounts, is in 1928 in the form of a recording by Kwame Asari, also known as Jacob Sam. So, yeah, Professor was of the Gold Coast, readily understood, linguistically relatable, with Primal alias is often the case with popular music motifs. Dr. Amu con continued on to research traditional music and drama in depth and incorporate that and in his understanding of the motif used in Yang Kosa to create an African idiom to guide his compositions. Self acceptance and authenticity are both important requirements for self actualization. Popular music voices the stories of who we are and what we go through. Popular music work, um, it validates us and allows us to be authentic selves. I, for one, could never have found validation in being a rapper 
were not for my iconic predecessors such as uh, Reggie Rockstone, Obrafo and Comfort Quade, who were able to make music with style and content centered on the Ghanaian experience. No amount of time I spent listening to Nas, Jay-Z, or... Uh, uh, those people. <laughs> <laughs> Could have brought me that validation to be my authentic self. Because the stories they told, no matter how relatable in a human sense, were not Ghanaian stories. I could not always easily see myself in them. As opposed to, um, yesterday was uh, the 20th anniversary of the, the most classic hip hop album in Ghana called Pamita. And as opposed to when I first heard this, yeah, let's remind ourselves. Is this familiar? Historically, 
our customs have had music as an intrinsic component. We have drum drummers at chief chieftaincy events and traditional festivals, funeral dirges, tell stories of the daily departed, and songs for war time. Today, however, in addition to all this, we now have an increased use of music for comments, adverts, movies, TV shows, for politics, and for a competitive church industry. We all bear witness to the fact that in these times, not a single election nor product rollout occurs without an appropriation or tailor-made use of trending popular music. Correct or wrong? True or false? Viral cultural moments that dominate popular discourse, such as ba ba ba, 2000, are amplified by popular music, while others, such as the infamous Wampona, are created by the music. It is apparent today that popular music is increasingly harnessed for fleeting cosmetic purposes and rarely ever for top tier transformation, such as an, an agenda of self actualization. Musicians and composers in the popular music ecosystem, aka rappers, create not just out of a visceral need, but for the purposes of business and subsistence. This is just the reality. Creators mostly seek to pursue music and the cultural influence in Wales to cash in. I believe the lack of infrastructure to fairly financially reward Ghanaian musicians for output, popularity, and cultural relevance has made the situation more acute. Systematically, music making is more of a financial grab than towards any kind of concerted societal transformation agenda. Um, I think this is the focus. Evolution of popular music resonance. It can be argued that from the late 50, 1950s through the, through the 1970s, some popular musicians from Ghana left musical footprints in the world that are still unrivaled by modern day musicians of the hip hop and Afro beats ever. We see these are albums chatted in many countries globally, while other acts like Ego Taylor and Pat Thomas have toured extensively in many more lands than younger acts. So, to my other comrades, when uh, some of my peers come and boast and brag about how they've gone out to the world and all the things we've done, so we have not actually scratched the surface. Much more has been done before us. Um, they often they often benefited from the traditional music industry structure of labels and distribution, and sometimes state support, as was the case during the coming years. However, the marked difference in resonance between now and then is due to the shift in context of information consumption and human interaction. This new era of 24-hour news cycles and social media has arguably increased the resonance of popular music in the everyday lived experience of young people in Ghana. There is currently little to no research supporting this except, except anecdotally. So maybe this is a challenge for the academics amongst us to endowed in such research, so that in my next uh, one I can have a backing my information, not I can do things. Today, young people are more likely to express themselves online through hashtags and memes more than through ancient proverbs. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, the truth is a punchline truth. <laughs> <laughs> An illustration of this new shift is how the internet is rife with sloganeering power from content from popular music. Check these ones out. Vibe song. Living my best life. Boys are great. YOLO. You only live once. Forget you, be a. Need you, be a. Show my money, I don't care. Boys, Kaza. Forget you, yeah, you play. Oh my God. <laughs> In tandem to all this is the rise of celebrity culture and how the tales and relentless news stories about lives of popular musicians 
are consumed just as much as their music. A Shatawari schoolboy dispute on an award show will trample other issues of national importance and be front page of the daily graphic and many other serious news outlets. There are television stations solely dedicated to music videos and music news, as well as prime time shows on top radio stations that solely discuss popular music trends, artists, and industry events. This is all new territory to us. The new wave of Afrobeats, hip hop, and dancehall commanding the popular music space exists in a culture of sorts. Artists have fierce followings and are able to influence throngs of youth with their life views and philosophies, or I mean their views of life and their philosophies. The era of the artist existing in an aura of mystique is gone. Every single day, artists interact with fans online, detailing their lives, giving opinions, and directly reaching a staggering number of people individually and collectively. The influence is significant even when it's cosmetic. For instance, one only has to attend the yearly Lamem Gang concert in December to see over a thousand teenagers not there in activation, but with dyed hair, <laughs> and following the fashion of the group members. Sometimes the influence can also be culture shifted. Personally, I can share my own experience with the infamous God MC Cantor moment in 2016, <laughs> which caused major disruption and sparked numerous conversations about content, substance, and why we had normalized Western fashion and inferiorized African fashion. I'm sure Dr. Amu would have been part of that conversation since he lost his job partly because of what I wanted to dress. Anecdotally, I have met many young people whose life views have been shaped or shaken by these popular music occurrences that have an impact on the culture they identify and live within. For instance, I once received a heartfelt letter from a young man. By heartfelt letter, I mean and, 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 and a message via Instagram DM. <laughs> Since in this age, we don't write letters the whole way, unless, of course, for visa applications that we're doing. In the letter, the young man thanked me for making music that helped him make it through secondary school bullying. I was floored by how my making, how my ability to make different cool in the Ghanaian context was solace enough for the young man to make it through a trying time in, in secondary school years. But it was also quite instructive. We are now in a completely transformed era of consumer choice and content is led and fed by the free market. An 18-year-old in Ghana can opt for entertainment channels for the entirety of their waking hours. Popular music and popular music culture is at the fore of most of this entertainment. So, um, the next verse, potential for self-actualization, the reimagining process. In order to self-actualize, one needs to be self-aware and have a sense of self-regard. Popular music has the ability to normalize problematize and or amplify prevalent ideas about identity that are consequential to their formation. An example of this, in a society burdened with the vestiges of colonial impositions on identity, you will notice that in Ghanaian popular music for many decades, we've normalized the colorism through Mibroni. An affectionate term for my darling, that elevates a fairer or maybe a foreign skin color. Even the Bibini Bruni iteration of the joke to address a dark skin lava contains the same loaded colorist insinuation that arguably contributes to the skin bleaching economy. If the music I love and sing along to tells me it's okay, why would I think any difference? In the role of being able to problematize the 2007 hip life example, Miss Bell's 16 years son is a good case study. You know that song? Yeah. I mean, 16 years exclusively rejects the prevalent occurrence of older men being sexually involved with underage girls, as well as giving linguistic urgency to young girls to rebuff 
and reports the advances of such sexual predators. In a nation still plagued with, I think as high as over twenty percent of girls in child marriages, the importance of such pointed critiques and songs, which receive massive airplay, cannot be ignored. Interesting that it still remains Miss Bell's most popular star, right? So those who say substance doesn't sell, I mean, that's a lie. Yeah. The progressive effects on self-regard of our popular music is not always as a result of content, but sometimes because of the form. By this I mean musical styles that center African music idioms in its creation have an undercurrent of validation for our style of expression. Pioneering hip life figure, Reggie Rockstone, his name is coming up quite a bit today, told me a fascinating story about the creation and reception of arguably his biggest hits, Ah, featuring Heike Fusu. Ah, do you know that one? Reggie? He told me a fascinating story about the creation and reception of this which now I'm not going to say how you believe the biggest hit, it's the biggest hit, you confirm it. Um, the story is instructive in regards to this assertion about the importance of, of form. So this is the story Reggie tells me. So Reggie's younger comrade, Mensa, a 19-year-old musical prodigy, created a beat for half, centered on the familiar highlight guitar melody and drum pattern. Reggie recalls being immediately disinterested in the composition. For him, it was just too slow and too much of a departure from the tree raps over hip hop centered beats that rose into prominence. Mensa believing this was a game changing move for Reggie in really reaching the masses in a more profound way, pleaded his case to not have to be able to beg and beg and nothing. All best were off, Reggie left the studio. He returned to hear a magical chorus with a vintage highlight swagger from a then unknown KK Fusu, who Reggie had paid absolutely no attention to in the studio before he left. Ah, a mundane story of infidelity and heartbreak was felt across the nation, even winning him a Continental Cover Award as well. It was the canvas and the form used that resonated. Reggie's ah uh, has has a religious uh, has an interest has, has an interesting historical parallel with the impetus for some of Dr. Moose Elliott's earliest compositions such as Unipa Daonso, Man Be on Your Guard, or if it was to be a religion, Man for Day Guard. Dr. Moon once recounted to the BBC, quote, as a preacher, whenever conducting services, I found that when the hymn was announced and we were singing, you could see that only the literates were singing. The literates were not singing, not because they hadn't heard any voice. They heard the voice, but the singing was strange to them. So I felt that they were being denied something. I felt that our hymns should be written in our way of singing. I felt that our hymns should be written in our ways of singing. So I think we should we should hear how how you put that into application. Sí. 
it tells me something. Um, I think there's, there's that saying about everybody is a, a genius, but, you, you, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole life believing it's stupid, right? So I think um, it really did teach me about the importance of going to where you can reach people or connect to people the most. I'll conclude with a, le with a lesson learned from delving into the life and work of Dr. Ephraim Amu. Dr. Amu was a great teacher. And in researching his life's work, the thought hit me, every great teacher is a committed student. He was not dismissive of popular music, but rather studied it and applied lessons from it to his compositions that have for so long impacted many of us in subtle ways. It is time for us to commit to a serious study of popular music. Reducing it to a passion fact for the youth is risking losing it as a tool to shape behavior in an intentional way. A cultural revolution in how we see ourselves as possible and popular music is a major key. Thank you for your indulgence.
pay your indulgence because I think he wants a drama. So, will you help me back? Can, can I do a, a, a clapping pattern that we all join in? Young lady, tell me down here to the ocean. Release the bomb, you know where they sell me to the ocean. Say to me, Sally, where they sell me to the ocean. I'm not jacking, just something to touch on. You know how the economy did, just being for the house. Just for the night work, and the ratio of our slide work, just to be scared of the high work. Back to the young lady, you know what I mean? Put it in all the same, same. Look at the big time, she's a big time. Go ahead and hit me up. Come small, go ahead and hit me up. Go ahead and hit me up. Nobody needs to hit me. She's just like the drugs. I need to. I'm finding my business. I hate to put the ass in the past. Lyrics 
of some of these songs. Sometimes you cringe when you, you listen hard that this is what the children are being fed. Perhaps if we listened hard enough, we could do something through and with the rap music. It does sound noisy sometimes. <laughs> but that's only because it's my age that's showing. <laughs> and it is our duty to adopt that vehicle to reach our young people. To let them know that this country is for them and that they must one day take over.